Here is an example right here of how this applies to environmental science, native versus invasive species. So when you're going down the boardwalk on one side is native on the east side and then on the west side of the boardwalk are non-native plants. Can someone unmute and tell me one non-native plant? They're being compared to the zebra mussels of the plant world, a type of tree so invasive, they're taking over some Austin parks, killing off pecan trees, elms, and live oaks. KVU's Jenny Lee reports on the effort underway to get that species under control. Definitely you want to wear your gloves because these things are sharp. Stephanie Simmons strips off a ring of bark, a process called girdling. In a year, it's expected to kill this tree. As a tree steward, it's a practice she usually doesn't do. This is the only thing I really will kill. But this isn't an ordinary tree. Do you consider the glossy privets the, the zebra mussels of the plant world? Yes. Yes. Glossy privets are an invasive species that are taking over parks and green spaces in Austin. Simmons is an urban forest steward and says they're killing off the native plants. So volunteers with Keep Walnut Creek Wild are trying to kill them off instead. They just ruin the ecosystem. Ivy. These beautiful fish are called koi. They're related to a carp and they've been introduced in a lot of different places. You can even find these released in the Trinity River occasionally, but uh, they're an ornamental species that can go for a lot of money. Some of these fish that are really, really beautiful um, can be sold for thousands, tens of thousands of dollars. On dendrochronology, so since trees can be thousands and thousands of years old, you can look back in history looking at these tree rings. So how can you count rings? How can you count the rings without cutting down the tree? They use a special tool called an increment borer. Scientists drill right through a living tree trunk and extract a sample without hurting the tree. The sample looks like a long pencil with strips, stripes across it. So here's an example right here. So you can go to any tree and drill a tiny hole into it, pull it out, and then you can look back in time at the tree rings, which is really, really cool. So some of the things that you can learn from tree rings, like the diameter of the tree ring right here, you can see these really thick rings. That means it was a really wet year and the tree grew a lot. Whereas these really teeny thin rings, that means there was a drought that year, so the tree barely grew at all. Um, here's an example of a dead branch, insect attack, lightning strike, disease. You, this plant here is called jicama. Jicama is a really cool plant for several reasons. For one, as you can see on the sign here, the seeds contain the poison rotenone. Rotenone can be used as a pesticide and it can also be used to kill fish. So you can watch videos of folks in Central and South America smashing the seeds of this plants or roots of different plants in water and then the fish die and then they're able to pick them up and um, cook them and that denatures the rotenone so it's no longer harmful and then you can eat them. Another neat thing about this species is it's in the family Fabaceae or the pea family which means that it can fix nitrogen. So it can take nitrogen out of the air and make it available to herbivores. So what do chocolate bars and flies have in common? So cocoa trees produce tiny white flowers that grow into football shaped fruits that contain large seeds called cocoa beans, which you make chocolate from. The tiny white flowers are pollinated by small flies called midges. Without the midges, there'd be no chocolate. And it takes approximately 40 cocoa beans to make one chocolate. The black and yellow coloration on this bumblebee serves as a warning sign to would-be predators, a term called aposematism in environmental science. There are several other insect species that mimic this same coloration, even though they're non-toxic, a term called Batesian mimicry. A sign that talks about succession. 
This is also covered in our textbook and on the AP exam. There's primary and secondary succession. Primary succession occurs when it's on a surface without soil, so bare rock, for example. Like if you had, if you abandon a Walmart parking lot, eventually it would become a forest. That's called primary succession. Whereas if you abandon a um, cornfield, that's called secondary succession as that changes over the years back to a forest. So here on this, we're going to look at that third paragraph right there. And it talks about um, Mount St. Helens. So back in 1980, there was a volcanic eruption that leveled an entire forest, killing all the plants and animals and leaving the surrounding area covered in a thick layer of ash. So this was a perfect time to study succession. Two years later, a lone lupine grew in the ash field. 25 years later, grasses and wildflowers and small trees. 20-foot tall willow thickets host a wide range of bird species at the edge of water where fish and aquatic creatures thrive. Douglas fir trees are the dominant species in the tall forest that once stood there and are starting to emerge again through the grasses. Some now even produce cones, which means they're reproductive. So they're guessing perhaps 150 years, the trees will stand tall over the mountains. So that's secondary succession because there was soil there. If you look at primary succession, it usually takes several hundred years, if not thousands of years. This is a red-eared slider. It's the most common turtle in Fort Worth and in the Trinity River. It's also been introduced throughout the entire world. These are the ones you find really cheap when they're teeny tiny babies. People buy them as pets, but they usually live decades and decades. So oftentimes when people go to college or they get sick of the turtles, they release them. Ancient forests. So millions and millions of years ago, the plants that were there became submerged underwater in mud, which prevented them from decomposing. And over long periods of time, the plants were buried deeper and deeper where heat and pressure transformed them into rocks like coal and liquid like oil and volatile gases like natural gas. So through all of this, fossil fuels kept the sun's energy locked underground. But today we use the energy to power our cars, heat our homes, light our streets at night, etc. So when we burn fossil fuels, we are taking carbon that's been buried in a carbon sink for millions of years and we're putting it into the air. Much of it is as carbon dioxide, which is the number one gas they talk about with climate change. Check out this beautiful damselfly. Damselflies and dragonflies are in the same family, Odonata, but damselflies, when they sit, their wings are closed, whereas dragonflies, when they sit, their wings are open. Non-native and invasive species are really big deal with environmental science more so with animals we talk about in texas of course the fire ants that's almost always a question somewhere throughout the course fire ants were introduced from south america on the ballast which is the weight they put on ships so they would put a whole bunch of dirt on the ship to keep it stable in the ocean and when it landed near mobile alabama they released the fire ants and the fire ants have spread throughout the south southern United States um, and that's one of the major reasons horn lizards are not around anymore. This is the awesome ginkgo tree which is a living fossil. It used to be thought extinct but the ginkgo tree is found in the fossil record 150 million years back. It died out in North America about 7 million years ago and was rediscovered in China and introduced to the Western world in 1874. Long lived, some specimens in China are well over a thousand years old. While most plant families have hundreds of species based on similar flower structure, ginkgo trees are so unique that the one species has its own family. Botanically, ginkgo trees are related to cone bearing plants such as firs, spruce, spruces, and pines, in spite of having no other resemblance to them. The seeds born on female trees, while famous for their putrid odor, are used in making traditional Chinese medicine, several foods, and even candy. What a cool tree.